Welcome to the Certified Local Government Virtual Summer of 2021 Training Series offered by the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office. My name is Christy Brantley and I'm the Local Government Coordinator. The first session of our 2021 Training Series discusses disaster preparedness and recovery. In this session, Restoration Specialist Reed Thomas will share lessons learned from past disasters. Serving out of the Eastern Office in Greenville since 1990, Reed works in 18 counties in the Northeastern region, providing technical restoration assistance to hundreds of private and public projects. Reed specializes in early building technology, historic paints, building conservation, and disaster planning and recovery. He is a recipient of the Quinn K International Fellowship where he studied Scottish building conservation techniques and fire protection for historic properties. Reed was awarded the Robert E. Stipe Professional Statewide Historic Preservation Award in 2006. He currently serves as a member of Edgecombe Community College's Historic Preservation Technology Program Board of Advisors and Cultural Resources Emergency Response Team. Thank you, Reed. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Christy. And uh, hello, everyone. It's, it's great to, to be here today. And I wish we could all be in person, but uh, perhaps we can get together soon and uh, for presentations and certainly working with our great commissions across the state. Um, I hope the images are clear and go through. I'd hate to have to say a thousand words for every picture that doesn't show today, but uh, I, think, I think it looks like we're good to go. I hope this presentation will be um, beneficial to you um, and your community. Well, as we kind of bounce back from the pandemic and things are opening back up, the last thing that we tend to want to think about uh, are natural disasters and, and even disaster preparedness. As a matter of fact, this morning, all I could think about was making sure all of our Winston squeaky toys were put away so that we'd have a little bit of quiet during the presentation. But why prepare now? We have had an absolutely gorgeous spring, beautiful weather, cooler, um, yeah, a few storms coming through, but by and large, very calm and, and just a, a really wonderful spring. Uh, why prepare for your home, your business, your non nonprofits? Uh, why is it important to do that now? I hope to share um, really primarily hope to share the reason for doing this in this presentation and, and some thoughts that I hope will uh, be beneficial to your community um, with the focus on kind of the key lessons learned from disaster recovery and response largely, including some practical ideas, tips, things that uh, we've picked up on and shared by property owners and contractors and, and communities. I want to touch on as well some opportunities that exist, such as educational opportunities, uh, resources, and even touching on some planning um, ideas that might be worth considering in your community. Well, can challenges be opportunities? And, and that's something that um, I think it very much can be, and I think we'll demonstrate that um, as we go through. Uh, our office, I work out of our Eastern Regional Office in Greenville, and our regional office services 27 counties in the Northeast. Uh, we have really amazing collection of uh, cultural heritage properties from this, from the oldest stated house in Edenton that was dendro dated for dendrochronology in 1718 to some really wonderful 20th century, 19th century properties all across the region. And some amazing nonprofits, such as the E.J. E. Hayes Alumni Association. Uh, Colleague and I met with these four youthful 70-year-olds who championed the rescue of this uh, real, once endangered Rosenwald School in Williamson. And through their hard, incredible work, they managed to succeed in getting the majority of the building uh, restored. Uh, a lot through volunteer assistance and just some very creative thinking. Um, so just an amazing project. And this is a community center, multi-purpose facility. And it's certainly um, going very strong um, 10 years after the work was done. 
Also a shout out to our partners with the National Park Service for their great work on the coast. Um, this is a very successful rehabilitation of a National Historic Landmark, the 1960 Wright Brothers Visitor Center. Um, just an amazing project, uh, well worth going out to see the new exhibits and the work that was done on this building. And a huge number of historic preservation tax credit projects across the region, uh, including this award-winning project in Elizabeth City where the friendly wig shop was converted to kind of restored back to its historic appearance uh, by a couple who bought the building to kind of give back to the community. And, and it's a this commercial space downstairs, apartments upstairs. Uh, this really great mid-century modern um, garage building. The house was rehabilitated with tax credits as well as this garage that was converted to two really well done apartments in Greenville. And this charming house in Edenton that was converted into a single family uh, rental property through the historic tax credits. But all these great projects, we have been battered by storms in recent years, uh, including this uh, the Lowry Chesson building in Elizabeth City, the Arts of the Albemarle. During the restoration, it got hit by Hurricane Isabel, which took off a large part of the roof. And luckily, um, they were able to um, save the building and rehabilitate it successfully. And when we think about the coastal region, we think about hurricanes. Um, and certainly that's our biggest storms that we, we, we have faced. But if you look at North Carolina State University has really great uh, information on their website about uh, tropical cyclones, hurricanes, and it shows three paths that these storms typically take in North Carolina. And if you overlay our uh, Historic Preservation Office's GIS map showing historic properties across the state, you can see that a lot of properties, it's a widespread area that can be impacted by tropical cyclones. Well, let me also first, let me acknowledge certainly some very powerful teachers and, you know, kind of lessons that I wish we had no experience in whatsoever, but sadly it's part of our story. So I'm gonna share just a few silent clips of, of some of the damage that, that we have seen and experienced in the region. And I think if there's any reason for why prepare now, this, this is it. Um, when you have a storm such as Florence that really did significant damage in Newburn flooding, uh, Dor Hurricane Dorian and Ocracoke and certainly Hurricane Floyd, um, the, the amount of uh, damage um, was quite overwhelming to homeowners, to business owners, to the community, staff, um, um, to the point where they could not keep up with all the requests for urgent help. So I think the overwhelming challenges faced during these storms is really, if anything, the reason to try to be as prepared as possible. But when you're looking at preparedness, there are three things Really, if it's your home, your business, your nonprofit, or your community, what are the risks? Are you in a zone where you're going to get potential flooding, tornadoes, or the problem? What kind of issues do you have? And what can go wrong with your buildings? And is there a, how can we make the buildings more resilient from, from the simple, starting with the simple and the practical solutions to a little more complicated solutions such as elevations. You know, how, how can we best make our properties more resilient? And this again, kind of falls back to um, experience with disaster recovery and, and relief and what we've learned. And these are the key things that we've picked up on, colleagues and I have picked up on. And this is a recent picture of, from Hurricane Florence in Newburn. And it's just really sad to see a lot of historic materials being pulled out of buildings. And, and even if it wasn't historic, it was really good sustainable materials that could have been repaired and, and, um, and, and maintained. This is a, sadly an example of a flooring on the top, a really beautiful tight grain yellow pine that was taken out of the house and replaced with the flooring as you see below, this um, sapwood, yellow pine. The, pine, the original flooring on top had the, the tightness of the grain is very resilient to 
moisture absorption. Rare for moisture to actually go through that wood unless it's soaked for hours. It's usually just on the surface and just slightly below. Whereas the board below, it's gonna soak all the way through. That board will warp and cup and it's gonna be less sustainable in the future. So this is one of the real painful things that we, we've seen in properties um, and including things like removing plaster that doesn't always need to be taken out. Um, and as you see, we'll share, I'll share some tips and practical guidance kind of throughout uh, just to illustrate um, this point. The plaster by and large does fine, even to this kind of damage, it can be generally repaired. And this is a, a good repair in, Eden, in um, Nearburn where the property owner took out um, the plaster just above the water line. And probably this could have been um, done without taking out the plaster by pulling off the baseboards to help promote drying out the walls. But nevertheless, this was really a great way to save most of the plaster and, and for the property owners to be able to get back into the house sooner and without, with less expense. Um, we often see materials being taken out because they've got water that's been contaminated. Um, and generally materials can be cleaned and, and um, salvaged versus removing. Uh, drying has been a, uh, you see buildings that are dried naturally, uh, forced air drying, such as this uh, gas dryer. And uh, it was a property that we visited a few years ago that had gas dryers put in it after a flood. And it actually caused so much warping in the flooring that it was buckling the siding up on the outside of the house. So kind of slow natural drying is generally best or controlled by a professional that really understands how to dry things out evenly. Uh, but often buildings that are dry just naturally do, do just fine um, as long as the buildings are opened up, um, particularly opened up through the attic, from the attic down to using fans to pull the humid air out can, can, do, can work well. Um, this is a very clever um, drying technique that a property owner in Newburn used. They actually took the siding off on the outside. The house has paneling on the inside or wainscoting. So instead of taking the paneling off, they took the siding boards off. The siding boards could be put back. They're drying it out. And then they have the, uh, the plastic up that they can close down if, if it's raining just to keep it dry. So it's a very clever idea. And this was similar to what was used in at St. Thomas Episcopal Church in, in um, Windsor. This building has since has been elevated since Hurricane Floyd, but during Floyd, it, it sustained quite a bit of water and um, it has been elevated, dried out. And now it's, it's absolutely immaculate on the inside. You would never know that there was a flood. It's got original flooring. And what we did as a demonstration project was to take um, several siding boards off on the outside and that served as a kind of a, an area for the citizens of the community to be able to come and see how, how this building was being properly dried out. <clears throat> also a similar project at the Freeman Hotel in Windsor, this um, early 19th century hotel building had been moved from its original site down towards um, the um, Kashai River. And sadly it flooded during Floyd and, and subsequently with other storms and you can see the flood level um, prior to, um, this was um, a, a more recent storm and the, cha uh, the Chamber of Commerce actually moved out of it after this last storm. But what we did was got volunteers, we pulled out, cut out the drywall above that water level, pulled out the insulation and let the walls dry out naturally. And then uh, treated the wood with a a, a safe wood preservative, a boron-based wood preservative is applied when the wood was wet. It soaks in really well and it helps reduce potential for decay fungi as well as potential for mold growth. So there's a video that we produced on it that's available on the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources website on drying out water damaged buildings. It goes into a lot, lot more detail. Uh, Buildings often, you see failure in structures, sadly because of often hidden structural damage or damage that's um, kind of ignored for a long time. This is a kind of an example of, you know, potential failure on a 
porch column and a high wind event because of the extensive decay. Fortunately, this column has been repaired. So the building is, is, is in pretty good shape, but this kind of damage can lead to some um, significant damage in a windstorm. This really very significant African-American lodge, the Edenton St. John's Lodge sadly um, was, was severely damaged during the March windstorm. And in looking at the building, uh, there was significant termite damage um, that was concealed, was really hidden from view behind the artificial siding. And also there were some structural cracks in the foundation and with com combination of the winds and the weakness of the, of the structure, it, it sadly failed during, during the windstorm. Uh, this is Rehoboth uh, Church in Washington County. It's owned by a nonprofit that rescued the building and has been restoring it. And we did a, a kind of a cursory inspection. And up in the attic, there was a, one of the rafters was split, or two of the rafters were split, probably from a fallen tree limb years ago. This is a real simple fit. So she's putting some blocking, jacking this back up into place, adding some two by framing members or bolting them to the cracked framing member re, kind of reestablishing the structural stability. And then of course the organization has gone on to do additional work, repair the windows, um, the siding, put shutters up. And thankfully they did because it was hit by a tornado in 2017, the day before we were gonna get a, give a presentation in the building on building maintenance. Um, and luckily it did lose some metal off the roof, but luckily the repairs I think helped uh, protect the roof from partial collapse and more significant damage and also the shutters as well. So that little bit of effort really paid off, I think, during that storm. Kind of looking above, uh, sometimes uh, and I've seen many situations where tree limbs or trees have fallen on buildings So kind of looking at what's around the structure and does it pose any particular risk. The thing that's been, I think, a real shock to a lot of property owners, particularly when you have a larger storm that impacts many properties is trying to find contractors to come and do repairs. And it can take weeks or, or months sometimes to get somebody to come. So I think it's really worthwhile to try to build a relationship with a contractor as well as neighbors and community before a, a weather event happens. So that you have somebody you can call on to at least help, help you button up a building, put a tarp on it, do some temporary repairs and then come back a few weeks or months later. This property owner um, after having some hurricane damage, luckily had neighbors that helped them patch their roof. And then it took about six months to get a contractor to come and replace the roof. And this was pre pandemic and today contractors are super busy. So I think it's really worthwhile to, to try to build a relationship with the contractor that you can call on for your community. Uh, a lot of, sadly, a lot of historic buildings are lost because of storm damage, where often they could be preserved. Um, and, and we're seeing, seeing this in many communities. But we've also seen some success. This is uh, a historic hotel building in the town of Halifax that lost about 65% of its roof after Hurricane Irene leaked for several years. It was donated to the town. The town considered the option of demolition, but they really didn't want to. So they put it on the market. And along came a contractor who fell in love with the building, Mark Kurt. He acquired it. He put a new roof on it and it's been beautifully rehabilitated into apartments on the upper floors, commercial space on the second floor. So there are opportunities sometimes when you have something that seems like an overwhelming challenge to save all they did was just try and, and it worked in this situation. So I had us off to the town and certainly to Mark for saving that building. Uh, choice of materials after repairs uh, sometimes can lead to um, short and, and often long-term damage like this building, this basement of this historic courthouse that in a well-meaning attempt to prevent future floods from causing damage to the building. They trap moisture inside the walls that led to termite activity and wood decay and moisture problems. So that's going to be reversed in the, in, in the coming months, but 
it's just kind of the um, you know, thinking through using best practice practices for repairs. This is a, a, an example of a thick mill coating that was put on the outside of this commercial building in a well-meaning attempt to stop moisture from getting in. It trapped so much moisture, it started to decay the mortar joints. You can see the mortar on the back side of this coating that came off during um, a storm. So using appropriate best practices uh, can make a big difference. And also it's, it's a great opportunity with, um, to, to kind of prepare ahead to look at ways to have a voice in some building code regulations. And certainly as we see more weather events and more damage, uh, there are gonna be certainly needed code, increased code regulations. And I think it this gives us the opportunity to think outside of the box, come up with creative solutions to, to really save historic fabric, preserve historic fabric as much as possible. And in the Miami-Dade area in Key West, Florida, is the highest wind rated zone in the nation. And yet Key West has a um, huge number, amazing number of historic resources in a large historic district that, that survive. And if you look at them, you see original, you see historic windows, roof, historic roofing, and it, well back in 2002 and before they started planning and, and coming up with creative ways that they could retain the historic fabric, but at the same time meet current wind codes and increasing, increasing wind code regulations. So they came up with some really good ideas. On the left, you'll see uh, uh, traditional wood shutters that are, that are closed and secured kind of in storm mode. They have uh, impact resistant acrylic on the back. The panels are mounted with stainless steel screws and spacers so that the panels are not touching the wood. So they're not creating a decay problem, but when they're open, you don't see these panels. It was a very clever idea on the right. You see a window that um, has a, the um, hardware for, fairly inconspicuous hardware for a lightweight panel that the homeowner can get very easily install if the, wet, if the storm is coming. And the same is true for this commercial building in Key West where um, the commercial property owner has lightweight panels that are stored inside and when a storm comes and you can barely see, they're very inconspicuous, the fasteners for these panels on the outside. Also in Key West, you see um, a, lot, a lot of tradition, two types of traditional roofing used. Um, the um, press tin shingles on the bottom and 5E on the top. And the 5E on the top, by the way, it's a good lesson learned. This is a roof I had on one of our, our outbuildings that blew off, oh, within a year after I installed it, I did not put enough fasteners on the edge. And we had a, a, a strong storm that came through. So good lessons learned. In Key West, they have more fasteners than I think we would need here, but it's a creative solution to be able to use a traditional roofing type in the historic district. Also sort of something that um, you know, we're seeing more and more of is elevations and the opportunity to work with designs and planning for elevations in historic districts. And, and I certainly encourage you to contact our office for technical assistance in this regards. Um, and I have a colleague, John Wood, who's done a great video. Um, I think Christy can, can share the link um, on the elevations and John takes a deep dive into, into this, this area. We're also seeing sadly a lot of historic properties in, in rural areas and um, distressed neighborhoods kind of not getting as much attention. And uh, this is kind of an example of where, well, the house is pretty good shape. It's got some roof, roof that we look at some of the metal roofing is loose in area and can be secured. But the big problem here is of course, uh, it sits so low with uh, potential water problems around the foundation during a, a bad weather event. So I think certainly um, there are opportunities to, to really work with um, neighborhoods and rural areas to try to help come up with creative solutions to, to help make these properties more resilient and, and generate more awareness. And this is uh, just an amazing success story. Um, this was a, uh, a virtual walking tour video that was produced um, through a historic preservation grant fund for the National Park Service, our office in the town of Edenton. 
to kind of bring awareness to this important neighborhood and the challenges, the history and the challenges. And it led to ultimately the historic local president, historic commission, the local nonprofits, the town, the church coming together and property owners coming together to come up with ways to help stabilize and preserve Cadiz Church. And I'm thrilled just to announce that um, this church is being stabilized and will be rehabilitated, will be restored, as well as other and other buildings in that neighborhood. So it's, it's a really interesting video and, and, um, and really thrilled that this is, this is helping in a, a one neighborhood. Well, disaster response is, is something that I can't shout out enough about. And this, perhaps this story will, 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 will kind of explain that. Um, a, a structural engineer and I uh, volunteered for the National Trust and um, FEMA to do disaster recovery or disaster technical assistance after Hurricane Katrina in Mississippi. And we went door to door and met with this wonderful, wonderful lady who took us into her home, it was um, flooded up to the rafters. And, and honestly, I think the flooding in the home probably saved it from extensive wind damage from surrounding properties. So we went through the home and as we're going through looking at the structure and to see if there were really serious issues, if it could be uh, repaired. She was busy picking up objects, looking at them, caressing them, taking them out, putting them in this pile in the backyard. When we finished, we went out, told her that your home was in very repairable condition. It needed new electrical service and some other things. And she was so excited. She came and hugged us and been in her family for several generations. Then, then I asked, I said, ma'am, why are you throwing all these things away? And she said, well, somebody came along and said that if the water touched it, it had to be thrown away no matter what. And he said, well, no, ma'am, it can be saved. Uh, she was throwing away family photographs. She was throwing away, um, you know, certainly some furniture and things that were upholstered that probably couldn't be saved, but mo most of what was in there could be. So she went over and dug out this one tin enamel pan basin and brought it over. She just caressed it and she started tearing up. And she said this was her favorite possession. Her grandmother bathed her in it as an infant and she loved her grandmother. It was the only thing she had to remember her grandmother by besides the house. It wasn't a dry eye when we left there, but just to be able to help one person is well worth the effort to, to help out with disaster recovery and certainly ideally helping out more. Uh, but we do need more disaster response teams. We need more people that are interested in getting some training to be able to help in the areas that have damage after flooding. And, and you know, you don't always have to have all the expertise, the guidance, and I certainly don't. I mean, I'm still learning. I'm very much a student in preservation, learning something new every day. But we have people on speed dial, like uh, uh, the late David Fischetti. I called him from Mississippi, two or three houses, kind of asking him about things I was seeing. And, and I've never had a contractor, an architect, an engineer to say no, that they you know, won't be willing to take a call. They're all thrilled to help out. So I think there are a lot of people that are more than willing to help for disaster recovery. And then just a brief point on this, when you're going out to assist property owners, when people are pulling things out of materials, and when the lady was actually throwing away objects, we had I had some we had some handouts on preserving family photographs, um, preserving furniture, and other things in addition to the house that we're able to leave with her. It's very important to have handouts when you're out in the field, not an overwhelming amount, just succinct key key handouts that you can give to people because very often they, they don't have cell service or um, as, as example in Ocracoke um, after Dorian, we had cell service sketchy in areas, but you, where it was sunny, you could not see your screen. It was so hot, you couldn't see your screen. You're standing out in the sun. So when you go in the shade to try to Google something, look up something, uh, the mosquitoes would eat you up. But I think that having handouts is really important that have certainly web links attached as well. And then you can email people additional information later. Developing partnerships with organizations like the Cultural Resources Emergency Support Team, CREST, uh, at least being aware of them, where um, this organization, the volunteers actually go out 
and assist with recovery, but they also assist with technical advice for museums and institutions uh, that have collections. So it's a great organization and uh, certainly encourage you to, to reach out and learn more. There are boundless educational opportunities for uh, commissions, for communities. And um, I'm gonna show you a few clips of one. I'll take you through just a few. This is uh, preserving the historic building that was given. Several of these were given um, in the state through the North Carolina Preservation Consortium. It was really a building maintenance program, but maintenance and disaster preparation go hand in hand. And um, I'll kind of showcase showcase a few of these. And it's you know understanding the basics of how traditional buildings function. And then the best practices is what this presentation, some image rich presentation is, is really all about. Um, and, and this is one of my favorite paragraphs because it's really, truly, um, uh, it's, it's understanding how buildings, traditional buildings generally need to breathe and not trying to trap or seal in, not trying to seal in the moisture, which happens a lot. Um, also doing kind of assessments, a, a cursory walk around or top to bottom inspection of buildings. I got a call from members of this church in Scotland Neck. They had water seeping through the walls. Uh, you can see this is just during a normal rain event. Um, and after doing some, a lot of questions, found out that the, they had taken, they'd put a brand new roof on the building, had taken the gutters off. And then it started leaking pretty badly. Then they, tr then they treated the building with a, 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 a sealer, a non-breathable sealer. But where the water was actually getting in was through these hairline cracks in the masonry where um, when the gutters were removed, you had a lot of water falling on the building. It was finding its way in through these cracks. So even a normal rain event was getting seepage, but in a hurricane or heavy rain, it would have been pretty devastating. So the solution, because the expense, it would have been very expensive to repoint the entire building. And this is probably as a result of the mortar not curing properly when it was built. It was kind of a transition from line, line mortars to, to cement-based mortars. So they put gutters back on, proper sized gutters back on the building, and that has largely resolved the issue. So kind of doing that in inspection. And this is a very common problem that we see in, in historic buildings where, you know, well-meaning attempts to insulate a building. It's creating a moisture trap where the insulation is touching the back of the siding. And you naturally get water wicking up behind the siding. And it's really, even if you were to caulk all the joints, which we do not recommend, uh, water's going to still find its way in. This is a common problem we see over and over again, but it's being exacerbated by um, more weather events. And as we see climate change, climate change, this problem is getting worse. So trying to understand and trying to correct these as much as possible can make a huge difference. And certainly um, you can see uh, again, this historic property um, with not only um, um, you know, more rain and more you know, bad weather, you know, the use of less sustainable materials and non-breathable coatings often create situations that, that, uh, that, are, that end up being structural. And in our, is there a moisture problem? Big, big, probably the number one problem with uh, buildings in this coastal region is poor negative drainage around the foundation. And that can lead to some problems over time, termite activity, the structural cracks, to paint failure, to wood decay. Uh, and it really doesn't matter whether it's an early building or a modern building. I've looked at um, homes built in the 1970s that have had settlement cracks as a result of a large volume of water coming off a roof. And if you think about it, water coming off the roof, it's a substantial amount. If you have a thousand square foot of roofing and an inch of rain, that's 600 gallons of water. And even if you have gutters, you're in downspouts, you can still dump it around the foundation if you do not have some way of carrying that water away. And sometimes it's really difficult. This was a creative solution for one property is break, low brick drain where the water falls off the roof, hits the drain and it's pitched so that it pulls away from the house. Um, sloping the soil works in many situations. Or adding gutters. Gutters can be uh, hugely beneficial, particularly if 
um, you have some type of drainage system. At the bottom, you see a pop-up drain. This is in a very flat yard. The pipe up above to the right actually goes underground about 10 feet out. So when the water comes through the gutter down this pipe, this valve pops up and it floods an area, but it's away from the house. So this actually helped a homeowner with massive moisture problems for very, very little, little money to do this. Um, but what if we have a hurricane? What if we have 15 inches of rain and you have that same thousand square foot of roofing? What is that? How much does that add up to? How about a small swimming pool size of rain, dumping a small swimming pool of water around the side of your building? And that can certainly lead to serious settlement problems and long-term moisture issues. So I think um, coming up with solutions, and even if it's a temporary solution, such as these temporary downspout extensions, uh, the one on the bottom right, the homeowner is very clever. They actually ran this corrugated pipe for cinder blocks to hold it down. But once it gets water in it, it's usually not going to go anywhere. But you know, it's ideal to have a permanent in-ground drainage system, but unless if there's not one there, there, are, there is a solution. This also, we also have the opportunity to, to do more sustainable and better repairs in buildings instead of doing things that just haven't worked. And it's a combination of both traditional technology techniques, materials, and new techniques, materials, um, and, and very carefully kind of going through there. There are more and more breathable coatings coming back on the market that are allowing masonry and wood to breathe. So if water gets in, which it will, there's no way to keep it out. It can actually dry out without holding moisture in the building. Uh, they're coatings such as lime paint or whitewash that are um, becoming popular again. They can be used on plaster, drywall. Um, and it's, it's great in that it's e fairly easy to touch up. This was um, a touch up after a hurricane, uh, a little over 10 years after this wall was painted, just touched up the area that was um, damaged and, and lime wash, lime paint is very, is color fast. It doesn't really fade. And it's also uh, kind of mold resistant. It will mold, but it's very resistant to molds. It's a very smart um, and, and fairly inexpensive wall material that's, that's available. Um, the use of wood preservatives as we're seeing less sustainable materials available today, wood preservatives can help reduce the decay potential where you cannot get the ideal material for repairs. Um, so disaster preparedness and maintenance kind of go hand in hand. And it really, sadly, is something that is becoming second nature or, or, or should. Um, so as we're doing any type of home maintenance, um, we'll kind of keep this, you know, what can go wrong in our minds. There are a variety of sources, resources available, almost an overwhelming amount, and it's great to see more and more um, information from um, the, our, in, on our website. We've got several links and articles, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, FEMA. So there are a lot of really helpful resources out there. And this is a kind of an example of one of the articles on our website that just touches on the basics of, of pre-disaster planning. Sometimes things that we don't think about or we just kind of need reminders of like go through and do documentation every year, if not sooner on your house, your property with a video camera or camera. Um, and also having adequate supplies. And hint, hint, you cannot have enough buckets if you've got old chimneys or you know, just in general, if you have a, a roof leak or something that happens and getting the proper size buckets. And um, I think a tip that I've learned is um, you know, when you have a big storm coming and you're rushing out to the hardware store with your list of all these items you need and you get, and you get sticker shock over yeah, how much did I just spent, you can start doing this in, in increments. Um, and every time we go to the hardware store, I'll pick up a five gallon bucket and use that as our tote to carry things around with. So we build up our collection with the tarps um, and things that you need for your specific building. So you kind of work on a list and, and try to get that together um, as well as things like plywood in case a window blows out, tarps. Um, this is on the right is a drawing that's in one of, one of the articles on the website that shows a really clever temporary clamp uh, system where you can easily 
install and take out um, a window covering or door covering without having to screw or nail the paneling the panel into your wall. So that's some very simple things. You can actually have these cut and have them ready if you need them. And they're great if you're doing window maintenance and you need something to put up without nailing it into the outside. The National Park Service also is a wealth of information, including this, um, this uh, preservation briefs, uh, as well as disaster information. And I'll have to shout out to them for their really wonderful um, guidelines on flood adaptation for Stark buildings that um, have been recently um, um, available. They're, they're now fully illustrated. So I hope you'll please go and take a look at these, particularly if you're in an area that's prone to flooding. And also outside the, the, um, our country, this is one of my favorite um, resources. I've read this many times. This is uh, an area in Southern England in particular that's seen flooding for a long, long time. And there's some really great guidance in this. Um, so it's well worth, you know, resource if you're really interested or need to read more, learn more about flooding in historic buildings. Um, also our historic preservation tax credits have been really hugely helpful for a lot of property owners that have had damage, or if you're just doing, you need to do major repairs or repairs that will help make your building more resilient. There are um, two types of tax credits available in North Carolina, an income producing and a homeowner's tax credit. So please um, take a look at our website or contact us for additional um, information about these tax incentives. So the, it is the opportunity, this is really truly the opportunity to get together and try to start planning. This is a simple thing to do. Uh, if you're a homeowner, you know, getting together with your neighbors or friends and, and having coffee or pizza or whatever, just getting together and start to discuss, okay, and helping each other out. What are you know, potential risks? How can we be better prepared? And certainly for your community, this, this is a great time to, to do it while the weather is calm, while we have this opportunity. Uh, there are community resiliency workshops that have been hugely successful in a lot of really high risk coastal areas where um, bring together many different organizations and citizens in the community and the citizens in the community are very much a part of this um, concept where they're reaching out to citizens for what they value for their cultural heritage properties and working together to um, look at ways to make the cities more resilient, but it also generates awareness and um, bringing people together. So it's a really, truly wonderful thing to, to, to look into. Um, this is a retrofit study of um, recovering resiliency initiative that, in, that involves several organizations and agencies come together to look at the town of Williamston, I mean, town of Windsor. We also did the same thing with the town of, of um, Principal in the Northeast region. And, and these will produce some very helpful guidance and, and certainly involved historic preservation. So as we're looking at these historic buildings, you know, we had a voice in this building is a great building to be saved, information about the tax credits to make it more financially viable. But what about commissions? And I think this is a time and the opportunity to brainstorm some creative ideas to, to, to do more with education, to invite people to speak, to do virtual workshops, to do training on maintenance and other things that could help your community depending on the needs, as well as updating design standards. So um, colleagues and I have been recently working with the town of Edenton and Beaufort in the revision uh, update of their design standards. And they are including new sections on disaster recovery and preparedness with a lot of great resources. And this will be published soon or available soon on the web. So I really encourage you to consider um, looking at your at possibility of including disaster preparedness and recovery um, in your design guidelines or design standards. And shout out to the city of Raleigh. This was on their website has been on the website for many years, a go-to place when you have disasters in your community, because again, it can be absolutely overwhelming and to have information about it posted on the website so people can know what to do, the processes that are set up. 
um, in the event of a disaster to help make the, help make the, navigating the, um, the, the the challenge much easier for everyone. And 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 I can say that. Um, sadly, you know, it's been a, this has been a nightmare for a lot of property owners, business owners, but also of city staff and even state staff. Just the challenge of, of helping everybody in need at one time, and and um, there have been staff, city staff, planners that have left, re resigned shortly after a disaster because it's just been super overwhelming. And while we can't be fully prepared, every every new weather event brings something new and new surprises it can certainly create more peace of mind having things set up ahead of time. And it doesn't have to be a grueling task to pull these together. Um, and this is uh, uh, thankfully the um, Will Willis uh, store and fish house national register rare surviving uh, building type in Ocracoke was elevated, about, finished elevating in about two weeks before Dorian and, and it did get some water inside, but it had not been for the elevation and the new dock building probably wouldn't survive. So, um, you know, preparation can really give us more peace of mind. Um, I'm not worried about running out to the hardware store with 500 other people two days before a storm. We've got our items ready to go, except for maybe some food and things, but um, but yeah, I think the better we can be prepared, the more relaxing it will be. Because what we're all in this to try to help help our communities, uh, preserving places that matter. And I'll have to say, um, people like Edith Sollings, who celebrated her 102 second birthday this year, and still doing really well. Very good, very good friend. She championed the rescue of this historic courthouse in Gates County not once but twice and still very, very active as much as she can be. Um, and really it's about all ages. Um, so um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you today and please feel free to reach out to my colleagues and me for any technical assistance that we can offer with disaster preparedness and recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reed. I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. That was some fantastic information. This concludes our first session of the 2021 CLG virtual training series. We plan to release a second session soon. And once it's uploaded to our YouTube channel, <clears throat> excuse me, we will notify you through North Carolina Preservation Listserv. Remember, if you'd like this session to count towards CLG training requirements, please email me a brief summary. And please feel free to email us with any questions or comments. We welcome your feedback. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.